Sarah McLeod, welcome back to Australian Musician. G'day, Greg. How are you, baby? Not too bad. Last time we caught up with you was at your beautiful uh, property in country Victoria with your music room and the old Packers, and uh, you've relocated to, to Brisbane. When did that happen? I know. That was so nice that you came over to my house. That was a good interview, too. I, I watched that back, and I was like, he's good, that guy. No wonder you good musician magazine. Uh, it's, it's, cool. it's all about the answers. <laughs> no, no, because, I, you know, I could talk a lot of shit, but it's good to have someone who asks the right questions. <laughs> but yes, Brisbane. So very different situation now. I'm in an apartment, um, and the the giant studio that I had before is now compact in that corner there that you can see. Okay. Um, I, I really dig it. I love it like this because I'm in the city, so I have inspiration and I can go out. Not that I really ever go anywhere, but I I can see things from my balcony and watch people, you know, and sort of get ideas and feel for city life. Yeah. <laughs> um, when we did come to visit you, it was because you were playing our Melbourne Guitar Show. Um, and I think it was one of the first times or the first time you performed your uh, One Woman Electric Show. I did, yeah. And it seemed to work. So I thought that I should put it into a whole tour and show everyone rather than just the people at the one gig. Uh, and then I had scheduled to do it pretty much soon after that last year. And then you know, with everything, it got moved. So now we're doing it um, this next month. Next month, yeah. It got moved. It moved three times. So hopefully, we do it this time. Yeah. So, what do you remember? What do you remember yeah. about the um, the Melbourne Guitar Show performance? Uh, well, my main memory is that I was really late, and I came running. It was like I was um, a bride late for my own wedding because everyone was seated, and there was uh, like a, a walkway down the middle, and the stage was up there with lights on it. And I came running through from the back of the room, down the middle of the walkway, like the, you know, stop the wedding, you know, with my guitar. And I had to quickly jump on stage because I went to the wrong venue. Um, so I remember that, you know, more than anything. And I remember being frazzled for the first few songs. And then I remember thinking, okay, I'm good now. And I didn't make any mistakes. And I think it went well. Everyone seemed to like it. Yeah. And your guitar system, uh, how did that go? Did you need to do any tweaks afterwards? No, no, it was great. I haven't done, I haven't changed a thing. It worked straight away. I mean, I, I put a fair bit of effort into getting it right at home. Um, there was a lot, you know, it's like a scientist just sitting there like sans lab coat, but um, I do have a white robe that I sometimes would do it in. <laughs> but it's just wires and it was trial and error. It was like, plug this in here, no. Try in here, no. Put it through that process, at no. Put it through this and then put it through the PA and chuck it through this EQ and maybe this October, yes. You know, it was just, uh, it took a long time of, stuffing around but i think i've got it now yeah um the upcoming tour you're uh supporting yourself you're playing piano to begin with and, and then you break out the guitars in the second half uh, do you need a different mindset for each half of the show um i probably shouldn't but i feel like i do because piano is new to me like i learned i learned piano pretty much in the last year i, I tinkered a little bit before but i had never really I'd never, I wouldn't say I was a piano player, but last year when, when everything got cancelled, I stayed home and I just practised piano. And so then I actually developed this new passion for it. And then now it's time to tour again. I just want to tour, I just want to play the piano. Like it's my new exciting thing. And I was like, I just want to go out and do the piano show. And my agent was like, you can't. You put together this electric show, it's great. You spent years putting it together. What's wrong with you? Like, let's tour that. And then you can play the piano. And I, I was like, yeah, but I'm excited now. So I put myself on as a support band, as the pianist, as like a, um, a little portal into where I'm going next. Yeah. So have you sourced a, a different piano for each show or are you taking a digital piano on, on the road? I'm taking a digital keyboard, yeah. Originally, I was going to bring in a baby grand for every show. And then I started thinking, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> I was costing it up. And I was also looking at the stage sizes and I thought, this is crazy especially for a support act. <laughs> I don't want to outshine the main act, you know. <laughs> well, I hope you get all, all the benefits of the main act. You, you get the lighting and everything. I've requested that, yes. <laughs> She's pretty good to be the main act, so I think I'll be okay. Cool. Um, so what gear will you be taking out on the road? Obviously, your, your Billy Thorpe Stratocaster is one thing you'll be taking. What else? Yep. Um, well, I've got those two... Those two guitars that I showed you, the right that I've put um, around it. So 
said earlier, this is the Billy one. Yep. So take this guy with me. Cool looking guitar. Um, and I'll take the black one, which is exactly the same as the yep. spare. Um, and I'll take the keyboard. And it may or may not take the acoustic, I'm not sure. So it's an awful lot of gear to be taking for one person. So I'll see how I go. Yeah. <laughs> and you've been rearranging a lot of your old songs. Has that been fun? On piano? Yes. Yeah. It's been. I think that's the best way to learn because um, when I started, I was like, okay, I, I know a few chords. So I thought I would I just learn something that I've already written, which is actually like, I was telling Kate Sobrano about this and she was like, that's a really hard way of doing it, dude. I, was, I pick up a guitar and I go, ning, ning, ning. And I get on the piano, I go, ning, ning, ning. And I go, okay, now what? You know, and then I just sort of rewrite riffs under it that work. Um, so I started by doing a couple of songs from Rocky's Diner and then I went into Super Jesus mode and I started rewriting super jesus songs and that's where i think i found my stride because i was because they're so vastly different and that's fun so uh, the the support set is quite a lot of super jesus songs revamped yeah so what changes are you having to make to your normal tour rituals um uh, i guess meet and greets will, would be very different or or off the cards completely uh no i still do that i'm just going to be working really hard it's going to yeah. be a hard time but I, I'm, I don't normally do this. I've never done two sets before. Yeah. Um, even when I was in a cover band, I never did two sets. But, you know, most well, – I've got friends who are in bands that they play like five sets a night. And they're like, what's wrong with you, McLeod? That's what we do. So I've just got to pull my finger out. But, yes, it's going to be a long night. But everything else will be the same as what it normally is. I'll still go out and say hello and, you know, play, play my ass off and sing my heart out and do the best I can. Yeah. Uh, 2020 was a tough year for all musicians, um, particularly hard for you because you lost your, your longtime buddy, your, your dog, Chachi. Um, you wrote a, a song in tribute to Chachi. Oh, yeah. It says, it says Chachi's. Yeah, that's great. She's a Chachi all over the place. I know. Yeah. I'm coping with well. <laughs> so is, is it easy to write a song about loss or is it really hard? It's hard, but it's easy. It's hard in the fact that it's difficult. Um, but it's easy for me because I'm talking to her. Mm. So I, that's easy. Yeah. Because I, I knew I had to talk to her, things to say. So when yeah. I find, sorry, yeah, so I find when, I, um, when I'm talking to someone in particular in my songs, if I know who I'm talking to, it's much easier to write. Yeah. If I'm just kind of like talking like generalization and, um, you know, trying to sound cool, it's, it's really hard. But if you're talking to someone in particular and you've got a, a heartfelt message to give to them, um, it's it's difficult emotionally, but it's so much easier flow-wise. Mm. Did you write much in 2020? Yeah, I've, I've got about half, a, half to three quarters of an album ready. So a few more songs and hopefully I will go into the studio and put a new solo record together this year. Cool. Yeah. Um, you're in the uh, in the uh, the Australian on the weekend, uh, listed as number four in the top ten uh, Patreon pages with your no. your Wolfpack Patreon. Um, what's the best thing about having a, a Patreon page? Well, I mean, apart from the regular income, I love the fact that I have um, a warm audience. It's I'm not cold calling into people. I'm not like I it's, I'm preaching to the converted. You know what I mean? Which is um, really helpful when you're creating because I don't want to say too much to people that I don't know because I don't, I, if I get any bad feedback in these delicate early stages of creation, it can make you just go, actually, you know what? This sucks. Forget it. So um, I, as I'm creating songs, I, I send them early demos and, you know, and sometimes they go, hey, it'd be cool if this was in it or that was in it. And sometimes they actually give pretty good ideas and I go, oh, yeah. I actually wouldn't have thought of that. Okay, I'll give it a try. Um, but generally, like, there's just this really good, warm group of really lovely people who support me. And they support each other too, which I didn't mm -hmm. expect. I thought it was just going to be, hey, everyone, look at me doing my thing. But they've all become friends because we have this spin-off private Facebook where everyone talks, which is not really – that that's not part of Patreon, but I thought it would be nice for them to be able to chat. So then they became friends. Um, and they, they all support each other and then they support me and – they help me because um, they give me inspiration to write something because I know they're there. Then they've got, you know, what, what are you doing? Play us something. And 
to have to have someone who's going give me something makes me want to write. Otherwise, I think, well, who cares? I don't have a deadline. I don't have a label like I used to, but I don't anymore. I don't have anyone saying this has got to be out by this date. No one's really telling me what to do. And without some sort of, you know, get in there and, and encouragement, I just sit and waft around for years. Yeah. So now let's do it because these guys are waiting for it. Yeah, and and you'll get to meet some of these people for the first time, I guess, on this tour. Yeah, totally. Well, I've met a lot of them in Queensland, so I've done a fair few shows in Queensland before. And you can always pin them because they wear these T-shirts that say McLeod's Wolfpack. <laughs> yeah, there they are. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's great. It's it's. I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. Um, one of the most challenge, challenging projects that you did, um, I think in 2019 now, was the uh, the Jane Eyre performance at QPAC. And I yeah. think you played several different characters. Um, how was the experience? That was the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. Yep. And we pulled it together pretty quickly because I didn't get the script until I think a week before rehearsals. And it was like that bad. And um, I had to write, I was told to write one or was it two or three songs? And then um, because I couldn't write until I got the script, I get the script at the last minute. I'm trying to learn all my lines and start writing the songs. And then in pre-production or rehearsals as they call it, I'm down there acting all day. And then I would go back to my hotel room at night and write the score. And I got so into it and I had such a great relationship with the director because he was really inspiring. He was everything I'd give him, he'd be like, oh, Sarah, this is lovely. You've exceeded my expectations. So I was like, really? Oh, great. So I was getting more excited. I ended up writing a whole album. So um, when we, we're talking about doing it again uh, next year. And so I've got a whole um, whole full length record, which is the score to the play. Yeah. Um, it says in your uh, press release uh, for this tour that you, you say you're a better lyricist um, than what you had been. You're, you're more succinct in your writing. Um, was that a sudden change or a gradual thing? Um, it, was a, it was a gradual thing. I think what, what it was was when I used to write with the Super Jesus, um, they've got this thing where they like things to be kind of vague and lots of metaphors and analogies because it sort of appeals to all different kinds of people and you can make up your own idea of what it means to you. And that's kind of a super Jesus thing. It started like that. It's always been like that. But then when I went solo, I started tailoring things more to what I was actually thinking because suddenly I'm not speaking for three other people and, and myself. I'm just speaking for myself. And then as I've started more and more writing, especially when I went to the piano, um, I'm realizing now that to just to be super honest and just tell it like it is, A, is easier and B, it's it's and people connect with it more, um, strangely, even if it's particular, but um, to, I've, I've got really, like I, I look at every line now as high class real estate, like I can't waffle, I can't say something just because it rhymes or it sounds cool. I've, there's only a limited number of lines I can put in each song. I've got to make every line count so that the listener is drawn in. I never used to think about this, but it's so clear to me now, you've got to bring the listener in, you've got to set up the scene so they go, okay, I'm here, like a novel. I'm, I'm here, okay, I get it, I look around, I'm in the scene. And then you've got to introduce what happens next and the characters and what it feels like and where we're going. And it's got to feel like a story that they can follow. And you want them to be able to follow it from beginning to end. And I've, I never thought that before. You know, sometimes I trouble remembering my own lyrics because they, they waffle a bit and I think that part doesn't even make sense. That's why I can't remember it. <laughs> yeah. So Maybe there are to do that lately and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Are there other artists you admire for the way they uh, attack their lyrics? Yeah, my favourite, dare I say it, my favourite's Taylor Swift. Yeah, her lyrics are just so good. She yeah. just, just gets in there. She's like a, a wonderful novelist, but to music. Yeah. Do you find yourself listening to different recordings now than maybe what you would have 10 or 20 years ago? Uh, I've always had really eclectic taste in music. Um, I'm listening to a, a little bit more modern music now than I used to. Like I've always been stuck in the 50s and 60s. Everything I love is like Motown and, and old soul singers and blues. And, um, but of late, I've been making myself listen to like sort of current music because I really 
am quite enamored with the production that they do these days. I love modern production. I love the way they used to write the old songs, but I love modern production. So um, I'm getting a lot of production ideas anyway. And then every now and then, an artist will come along that has the modern production, but also with great songs. And for me, my favorites at the moment, Taylor Swift and the new Sean Mendes album is killing me. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, nobody can tour overseas at the moment. Um, you've spent a lot of time overseas. You wrote uh, Rocky's Diner in New York. Um, is not being able to travel, does that sort of leave a big hole in your life at the moment? No, no not at all. I'm very happy here. I would be happy if I never had to leave this room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it in here. Like I sit in that corner with, at that piano with those guitars around me and all my pretty lights and a couple of bottles of wine and some candles and I shut all the curtains and like weeks can go by. I love it. I could spend, I could spend years there without even thinking, oh, am I supposed to be somewhere? Should I, should I call someone or interact with other humans? I, I'm, I don't, I feel like I'm, I'm a glorified caveman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we were talking about the Jane Eyre thing before, which was very different for you. Any, any other bucket list projects you've got in mind? Um, I'm I, well. I'm trying to work. I, I have I have sort of three different brains. So I'm, I'm looking at doing the uh, the other run of Jane Eyre. So I'm really interested in acting. I love acting because it's it's a whole you know other area of creativity that I, I get right into. Um, working on new songs with the Super Jesus to do a record with them. Not quite sure how long that'll take or when we'll do that. Um, but the, mainly that the, I'm working on this piano record for my solo thing. And um, because I can, I can see it formulating, because I'm up to about sort of six songs now, I can see it formulating and I'm getting really excited about, you know, where that will go. Because I have this vision of being in this like super heavy sonic rock band, Super Jesus, and then the other me, being in these beautiful theatres on a baby grand piano, like all dressed up with like pin drop choir, you know, with beautiful lighting and, and then everyone, thank you, thank you, yes, you know. I, I love that, that two totally different juxtapositions of performance. So, you know, yeah, at the moment I'm playing a little electric keyboard supporting myself, but this vision I have for the future in these theatres, like it's going to be so cool. I hope I can pull it off. I will pull it off. Yeah. Because I can see it. <laughs> I, I can picture it too. I'm sure it will happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, why not? You know, I just got to keep practicing and keep writing and, you know, and just put the show on. And if you build it, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> so this tour is, is very close. March 5 is the first gig in Ballina. Um, how do you and Ballina get along? Oh, I, I God, I love it there. I've got friends who live in Byron, so I'm going to go and make a few days of it, go and see some of my mates, catch a few waves. No, I'm not really... I'm not really much of a surfer, but I will get in the water gently, close to the edge, away from the sharks with my head up like this. <gasps> Don't let the jellyfish near me. Um, but yeah, no, it's great down there. Any excuse to go to the area, it's one of the best parts of Australia. Yeah, and then um, you finish up in, in Victoria at the end of the tour. Um, all things yeah. going well, uh, COVID-wise. Well, um, yeah, because Victoria was at the beginning of the tour and we luckily we moved it to the end. So, you know... Who, who knows? Look, it's so it, everything's so up in the air. I have the whole run in front of me, and I've I've written myself a a tour diary, but I've not booked anything. So it's all like you know, I w this is where I want to stay. This is the flight I want to catch. This is the hire car that I would like to drive in. You know everything, but I haven't booked a thing, and I wait till you know like a week before. And I go, yep, cool, okay. Let's see if that car is still available, or if that room is still there, and if I can still get that flight. I'm just sort of used to being fluid yeah well sarah mcleod we we look forward to the tour and uh it's been great to chat again thanks great good to see you again <laughs>